All right. So as <clears throat> as Ferdas already mentioned, so this is part of a book project which comes out of my doctoral research from SOAS. So I'm still revising or doing a final revision of the book manuscript. I'm very much looking forward to feedback, comments and ideas from, from your side. This book makes an argument about Arabic text circulation um, across the Western Indian Ocean during the early modern period. And what I try to do is I trace histories of circulation of Arabic manuscripts by studying the manuscript notes and paratexts such as colophons, reading notes and ownership statements. And I do that in order to look at the social and cultural mobilities of texts, the communities that shared them, the practices by which they did so and the places where they did so. And my main argument is that the surviving manuscripts allow us to study a field of Arabic learning. Um, and the field of Arabic learning that linked people, places, and practices from the Red Sea region to South Asia during the 15th to 17th centuries. So, but let me first set the scene for today's talk. So this is a map uh, you should see of the Western Indian Ocean and previous scholarship has crafted many exciting narratives about what connects this space. The monsoon winds allowed seafaring communities to establish a schedule for transoceanic movements. They went westwards during the early summer and eastwards during the winter. And over the 15th to 17th centuries, traders bought pepper in Malabar in South India and sold it in Yemen and Egypt, for example. Slave merchants shipped people from East Africa, in particular Ethiopia and Somalia, to uh, regions like Gujarat and the Deccan in exchange for textiles. Muslims from the Islamic communities of South Asia and beyond congregated in Mecca for the annual Hajj. And so what we can see that is that there are different connections, networks, and different mobilities which traverse the Indian Ocean during this period. Port cities such as Jeddah and the Hejaz, Aden, Surat, and Calicut in India developed into emporia or entrepôts, cosmopolitan places that harbored merchant communities um, from across the Indian Ocean world and places that were attuned to those complex schedules of incoming and outgoing commodities, all subject to the prevailing winds, of course. Thus, what we can do is we can plot a range of different stories of human activity on this map, and in the end, they will all be entangled to some degree. Uh, the result is a dense formation of economic, of social and political interaction. And in a recent book um, by Sebastian Prange, um, entitled Monsoon Islam, he has made exactly this argument that we need to look, look at the nexus of religion, commercial and political networks in the making of maritime Muslim cultures in this period. Um, and according to him, that Muslim culture was driven and sustained to a large extent by the spice trade and thus by very much an economic rationale. But what is mostly missing, I think, and a lot of others think, are cultural narratives that draw the communities of this region together along Arabic connections and Arabic mobilities. So we've had previous research on um, connected histories by Sanjay Subrahmaniam that pushed us to go beyond area study divisions that we very often see across the Indian Ocean. And people that heeded his call, are, for example, Ronald Ritchie, who proposed an Arabic cosmopolis um, and which ranged from the Middle East via South Asia all the way to Southeast Asia, where Arabicized Muslim communities adapted uh, local stories of conversion to their place of belonging um, and formed part of a larger trans-regional Muslim community. And they all shared an, and they, they shared an entire system of cultural references. And so building on this research by Ronald Ritchie, this is where my research introduces another conduit of text circulation, and that is Arabic texts and Arabic manuscripts written, copied and commented on, some also eventually forgotten, um, on the move from Cairo to the Deccan. So I'm looking at this Western Indian Ocean world from Cairo to, to South Asia. And the point is to look at um, communities and places in, in, in regions like Egypt, Hejaz, Yemen, Iran, Gujarat and the Deccan um, to study how, how those places were connected through manuscript circulation, how communities in these places perused Arabic texts. And thus, what I want to do is add another layer of cultural connections, uh, trans-regional formation of Arabic learning onto this map that we can see here. 
And I want to argue that, of course, um, this Arabic learning built on other mobilities. Scholars would sit on the same ships as merchants, but they would do so for different reasons. So I think there's another rationale of learning that we have to study here. And I argue that communities created their own deep structures, to borrow a term by Michael Pearson, and shared techniques and practices. And what we have today is fragments of these cultural exchanges that give us insights into this early modern world of Arabic cultural pursuits and where um, it happened or where they happened. So what I will present today is mobile manuscripts um, from the perspective of one library, uh, the Royal Library of Bijapur that you, you can see Bijapur here on the map, it's a city in the Deccan and the Sultanate in the 16th and 17th centuries. The manuscripts that accumulated in this, in this library show us how manuscripts traveled in this period um, and how they could be uh, signified um, in differently over time and how their function changed over time. But I want to broaden the context in the course of this talk. And after I've, I've talked about the history of this library, I also want to look at um, manuscript corpora in Cairo, Istanbul, and other places briefly in order to show how um, communities in these places um, engaged with Arabic texts and with Arabic learning in a very similar way, in a connected and shared way um, to Bijapur in this period. But let's start with Bijapur first. So this image shows the edifice of the library called the Azar Mahal, um, the Palace of the Relics. It's a two-story building which housed a collection of Arabic and Persian manuscripts, roughly around 400 manuscripts uh, in Arabic um, survive today and a few dozen Persian manuscripts. Um, and although um, I, I hear the, 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 the call that Ferras made at the beginning, we, need, we want to go be beyond Europe this story, of course, has also also has got to start to start in London, to start in Europe, and it's a story of imperial translocation as well. So, in the 19th century, the manuscripts that were housed in this library were transferred um, to London, and are today part of the India Office collections of the British Library. So, the translocation of this Azar Mahal Library collection um, has different steps from the 17th century to today. So at the end, towards the end of the 17th century, the Mughal Empire conquers the Sultanate of, of Bijapur. Um, so these manuscripts change hands, they go into the hands of, of Aurangzeb, the emperor and his officials. And um, we can see that because there are seals on the manuscripts, then it changes hands again, once the Nizam of Hyderabad declares himself independent, then we have Maratha incursions, the Raja of Satara um, takes care or doesn't take care of the manuscript. And in the end, by the 19th century, um, the region becomes part of the presidency of Bombay. And the British administrators in that period start thinking about what to do with those manuscripts. There's a French official um, who creates a first hand list and talks about the uh, very dire need to, to preserve those manuscripts. And then the commission of Satara engages um, the services of a certain Hakim Hamid din and a couple of writers to write up an Urdu catalog of the manuscripts. <clears throat> and this commissioner says that should any of them prove to be especially worthy, the notice of scholars, I would suggest that they be removed um, sorry, whether of notice of scholars, I, su I should suggest that they be removed either to Bombay or to the Library of the Honorable Court of Directors at the India House, as the provision of their safe custody at Bijapur is not so sure as could be wished, and they are they are useless to the poverty-stricken and unlettered inhabitants, and out of the way and very difficult of access to learned strangers. This quote doesn't need much more explanation, I think. What we see here is a justification for colonial practices of manuscript translocation that happened in several cases in the 19th century. Um, so many other, many other collections that we have in the UK today, for example, the Hamilton collection in the John Rylands Library in Manchester, um, collection, the Bailey collection in um, Edinburgh University Library, 
and also the Delhi collection um, in the British Library, they're all part of, um, or that they, they were all removed um, during the colonial period um, through different practices of colonial um, translocation. Some because um, some collections um, came about because they were created by individual collectors, because British administrators commissioned manuscripts or bought manuscripts, but other collections like the Delhi collection are to a large extent loot or plunder, which was moved over um, to, to Britain. Um, and although um, the commissioner here says that um, Bijapur was very much out of the way and very difficult of access to learn strangers, um, especially the library, I want to counter that claim and show how, if we look at the history of, of, of this region in the 16th and 17th centuries, how Bijapur was very much connected to the wider world of the Western Indian Ocean and became a hub of Arabic learning and Arabic scholarly culture in this period. And I will do this by looking at notes and marginalia on the manuscripts of this library collection and thereby try to, to tell a, a short history of the 16th and 17th centuries. Now, one of those um, great scholars in Europe was Otto Lord. Um, he created um, a catalog of the collection, uh, of the Azamahal collection, which was published in 1877. But also he based his catalog on the previous Urdu catalog and the previous hand lists. So he was not, not the, the individual who was sitting all by himself in the reading room and going through these manuscripts. He actually built his work, this catalog very much on, on previous catalogs. And today we're using his catalog to navigate these collections as I'm doing as well, of course. But then there's some other scholarship which is which is important to highlight here. Um, Salimuddin Qureshi um, hinted at a crucial characteristic of this Royal Library of Bijapur. Um, and that is that the Royal Library itself was not the place of production of the manuscripts, but instead those manuscripts in, in the majority held from across the subcontinent, from Central Asia, from Iran, and from the Red Sea region. And they cover most Islamic and Islamic genres of writing from Hadith to law, to Sufism, mathematics, philosophy, and theology. And we have another study of this collection or part of this collection by Keelan Overton, um, who looked at the collections of one Sultan of Bijapur called Ibrahim II. And by looking at, at this sub-collection, she could advance arguments about the courtly, courtly circulation of these manuscripts and what this, what the sub-collection of Ibrahim II meant to him as a Sultan. Now, in a nutshell, different personal collections of Sultans from the 16th to the 17th centuries ended up in this royal library. Um, and this royal library at that point was presumably located inside the palace. And the way that this happened is that mobile scholars and courtiers brought many of these manuscripts as gifts and thereby negotiated their relationship uh, with the court. They also often became then part of the royal entourage. They functioned as administrative personnel, as advisors, as teachers and tutors. And so by, by receiving those manuscripts, um, the manuscripts expressed the prerogatives of Islamic kingship for the Adil Shahi dynasty of Bijapur. According to Overton, the Azam Mahal was built through trans-regional connections, through tastes and precedents made possible by the movement of Iranian migrants in the early modern period. And they presented one of the crucial courtly factions um, in this period in the Deccan. And this Iranian migration has a longer history. It starts in the 15th century. Um, the Bahmani kingdom, who is the predecessor to the Deccani Sultanates, invites scholars from across Iran to come to the Deccan and to serve at the court in Gulbarga, later on in Bidar. After the breakup of the Bahmani kingdom, we see these five different Deccani Sultanates. Bijapur is one of them. And what happens now is that there's just there's, there's just a larger number of courts that offers patronage to scholars coming from coming from outside. These sultanates were all integrated in what recent scholarship has called the Persian world of circulation, which included objects and people, and in Overton's words, talent. It was a migration of talent in this period. And 
what we see here is um, is a what has been described as the Persian cos cosmopolis, um, which made India very much part of a larger Persian world that extended towards Iran and Central Asia. But looking at the manuscripts in, in the Royal Library of Bijapur, I think there is yet another um, sphere of circulation that we need to look at, and that's an Arabic conduit of circulation, which linked the Deccan with Egypt, with the Hejaz, and with Yemen in particular, but also with other parts of South Asia. And here I argue that um, by looking at Arabic and Persian, we actually need to look at two different spheres of circulation. Persian expressed royal authoritative forms of reception and circulation, and Arabic expressed the pursuits of a field of learning in this period. And thereby, I'm not trying to suggest that there's a dichotomy in, in cultural rules, but rather that we need to look at both of these languages together, and we need to look at how the court used Persian um, as, a, as a language of reception, and how scholars engaged with these Arabic manuscripts on a textual level. And I will argue um, in the following that by the mid 17th century, the Azar Mahal was then became more than a royal library, was transformed into a scholarly sociability, a vivid place of textual transmission that facilitated exchanges between learned people. And I want to describe this place as a textual entrepôt, building on the diverse, the diverse scholarship on trading networks in this period. They used the term entrepôt for the exchange of commodities. But I think we can apply that to text as well, because by the 17th century, the Royal Library of Bijapur is not a royal library in the sense of, of simply a place of conservation and preservation for the court and for the use of the court, but it's a place where texts are exchanged, where texts go in and out, and where a highly mobile community and learned professionals share these texts and study them. And so those are the three sort of argumentative strands that I want to introduce here, that Arabic and Persian are actually, um, um, Arabic and Persian uh, signify different practices of circulation. Um, but by looking at especially the Arabic notes and the Arabic, um, um, the Arabic texts, we can broaden the perspective on social groups in this period. We don't have the same prosopographical source base for Arabic that we have for Persian. So manuscript notes here are actually very crucial to get a better understanding of Arabophone communities in this period. And the, the last point, of course, is that the Azar Mahal becomes this textual entrepôt in the 17th century. So let's start unpacking that. Again, Persian scribe notations describe the realm of reception, storage, and inner courtly circulation. That's a point that Keelan Overton has made already. And she has pointed out that a lot of these manuscripts, they come as gifts. So Persian elites negotiate access to the court um, and bring these manuscripts as gifts. And so these Persian notes then signify some manuscripts as gifts, trophies, or other intellectual objects of sultans and courtiers. And what we have here is a manuscript note which signifies this particular manuscript as, as, um, as a trophy brought from the city of Bidar after it was captured in 1619. And we see this in the note stated here, which I will translate. So this item was integrated into the Royal Library after the conquest of the city of Muhammadabad, which is known as Bidar, uh, on the 9th of Shaban in 1028 or 1619-18. And we have a couple of books um, that were looted uh, during this time when Bijapur conquered Bidar, one of the other sultanates. And so we see that um, here the manuscript is becomes signified as a trophy and is thus integrated into the royal library. So here, this also points out that this Persian note is about the movement of the book, the book itself. Now, if we look at the Arabic manuscript notes that we find on, on many of these manuscripts, they showed a scholarly engagement and the engagement with the text in particular. So here's one manuscript, uh, which is a commentary by um, Al-Sirami, um, which is a widely circulated rhetoric commentary um, on the Al-Mutawal, which is also famous. And this is a colophon which states the transmission of this, of this version. Accordingly, um, 
described completed this copy in the year 1426, and he created this copy based on a transmitted manuscript, which in turn was based on a written version in the handwriting of the judge Badr al-Din Muhammad Asadi al-Hanbali, who was the overseer of the Sharia courts in the administrative unit of Egypt. Um, the actual transcription of this manuscript version took place in the year 1578 in the city of Ahmednagar, which is another sultanate in the Deccan. And the scribe himself is named as Yahya bin Shams Adin ibn Ahmed, uh, who copied this for another uh, different owner. So here we can see this um, technical procedure. The colophon documents this path of circulation that stretches from Egypt to the Western Deccan where it ultimately then ended up in the collections of the Royal Library. So what you can see here is how Arabic and Persian play different roles in the circulation of these manuscripts. Um, manuscripts become mobile socially and culturally, but um, through in, in different ways. The Persian notations refer to those manuscripts as a form of a mobile manuscript, as a book that can be exchanged, and the Arabic colophon looks at it as a as in its form as a in, in its transmission as a text. So on the one hand, um, we can see look at the development of this library as part of the courtly realm with its with its own modes of reception, uh, circulation and expressions of prestige conducted in Persian. On the other hand, we can also see the transregional entanglement that was sustained through the existence of a larger scholarly field. And that field consisted of itinerant scholars and other groups. Um, and they are more interested in how frameworks of transmission and scholarly practices are constituted and conducted in Arabic. So Arabic manuscript notes are notes of transmission, colophons, and ownership marks. And they also allow us to expand our social circle of learned man um, that we can see in this period. So here's another manuscript, um, which includes a Persian notation on the, the title page. Um, it's the work called Tahrir on the principles of Hanafi jurisprudence. Excuse me. And it states that um, this Persian notation states um, that the book was bought of the, out of the inherited property of a certain Alam Allah and was integrated into the Royal Library in 1614. We have a colophon at the end which gives the name of the scribe um, as Hassan ibn Ahmed, who finished his transcription in the months of Dhul Hijjah in 988 or 1580. And he did this after the afternoon prayer in front of the Kaaba, Tuja al Kaaba in Mecca. Um, and what we have here is another ownership note, note which then discloses the, the full name of the previous owner. And that is a member of the Al Aydarusi uh, group. He belonged to a Hadra Hadrami family. Uh, Eng Seng Ho has written an important book about this Hadrami family. They were scholars, advisors, and religious dignitaries um, that spread their transient networks across the entire Indian Ocean over several hundred years. So we have several generations of these scholars. And in the 16th and 17th centuries, we see a couple of these scholars um, serving in the Deccani Sultanates. And so in, in Bijapur, we have, apart from Allah Mala, we have another member and we have a total of around 14 manuscripts that I could find which belonged to both of them. And these manuscripts were left after, after they, presumably after they had left the court. Okay, so this is how we, this is how this Royal Library collection was built. Now I want to move on to the 17th century um, at the point when Muhammad Adil Shah um, is the ruler of Bijapur. And he decides, or at least according to the chronicles, he decides to, to turn the Royal Library into a shrine library. So what does that mean? For the 19th century, we have a British report that describes the function of the Azar Mahal. And I quote, this establishment was a kind of ecclesiastical corporation founded to guard at Tobruk, consisting, I believe, of some hairs um, of his beard. They had been previously enshrined in a citadel or royal palace, in a building which was burned down and in lieu of which the Azar Mahal was built by King Muhammad Adil Shah. Without the palace walls, but connected with the palace by a bridge. 
Large assignments of land and revenue were made for the support of the establishment, which comprised the species of college and theological school. It was probably to this branch that the establishment owes its library, which consists chiefly of theological and philosophical works. But the collegiate establishment exists now only in name, and the endowment has long since dwindled down to a miserable pittance, not sufficient to keep the building clean, or afford any surplus for defraying the expenses of the annual urus or urs when the relics are produced to public view. Now, to sum up what we hear here, what we've read here, is that by the middle of the 17th century, the library is not part of the inner citadel anymore, but it's moved outside of the palace. And this architectural branching out is something that we that we can still see today. This in addition, this Azar Mahal is now charged as an Islamic or holy Islamic place. We have these Arabic manuscripts, Persian manuscripts, together with the relics of the Prophet. These relics have been brought, particularly by um, uh, Muhammad al Hamadani, a traveler who comes um, who comes to Bijapur from Mecca. Um, the library itself remained affiliated with the courtly realm, so there's still a bridge connecting it to the palace, but it's now it's now becoming accessible to groups from outside because it's not spatially it's not located inside the palace anymore and what the court does under Mohammed Adil Shah is they recycle the manuscript collection um, to serve for new educational purposes and that has a wider context a wider political context so Richard Eaton argued that under Mohammed Adil Shah we see the emergence of um, a group of ulama and general religious scholars um, as a more powerful force at the court. So he argued that judges, preachers, and lawyers, and other professional and scholarly groups received courtly patronage through land grants and, and built up their political influence at the court. And so in this period, the Azam Mahal um, emerges as such an ed educational facility um, in Bijapur. And so what we can assume now is that the the manuscripts were used um, as for practical and more educational matters, in particular, the manuscripts from the philological disciplines. So we know from another historian um, uh, from the 18th century, Muhammad Ibrahim Zubairi, um, that two teachers were also appointed um, under Sultan Muhammad Adil Shah. So probably the manuscripts now served as instructional materials in the training of candidates for religious posts and different institutions. That the library now functioned in a more educational context and in a context where people came and uh, consulted the, those manuscripts, that's something we can actually see on the manuscripts themselves. Sorry. So here are two, two manuscripts. Um, of a, a text called um, Al-Wafi. The Al-Wafi is the text which is written in, in, in a larger script, five lines only, and then there are a range of different commentaries inscribed on these, on these different pages. And if we compare the text, we can see that um, the manuscript B3 um, is a copy of B2. Um, it, there's a similar layout, and they're the same commentaries that are referred to in the margins. The Persian notes, again, tell us a bit more about the circulation of these texts. So B2 entered the Royal Library in 1594. B3 entered the Qadiriya Library, which was another a Sufi library um, of the Qadiriya order in, in Bijapur, and then were later was transferred to the Royal Library in 1680. Both manuscripts have the same textual format, as you can see. And the comparison reveals that the exact same sections of commentaries appear in the margins. So presumably, there's a copyist of B3 that arrived in Bijapur, had access to the manuscript B2 that was already there, and produced a transcription of that text, which is B3 now. This book, or once that transcription was created, this book was moved to the Qadiriya Library, and the Persian notation tells us that a certain Taj Muhammad um, brought uh, the manuscript to the Qadiriya library. And then, of course, we have the notation that tells us that in 1680, it was moved back into the Azam Mahal. 
Um, and this is nothing out of the ordinary. We know from, from Richard Eaton's important work that there are different Sufi orders that inhabited Bijapur, and the court always had a very, well, for a long time, had a very close relationship with them. Um, so probably then this is this is also this is one way of of engagement between the Sufi groups and and the court. More importantly, for this purpose, the manuscript also shows other traces of engagement with the text. Um, and those presumably in the Azar Mahal. So the scribe of this text is called um, Mahdum Qadi Kabir al Milla wa Din ibn Qadi al Kabuli. Um, so presumably from Kabul, a judge uh, who arrived in Bijapur. Um, and what we can see is that he created this manuscript um, as, a, as a sort of studying device or through studying efforts. <clears throat> So again, we see that there are five lines of the initial treatise, and then there are different comments in the margins. And the way that this manuscript works um, as, a, as a studying enactment is, of course, different to these other reading enactments, which are more sort of compressed text blocks. But also what we can see is there is a separate uh, folio at the beginning, which lists the different commentaries that he that he used in order to read and engage with the treaties um, and another thing that we see is that th he probably created the fiqh list or the table of contents for this manuscript himself so to wrap this this section up before i move on to the next one what we what we've seen here from the 16th to the 17th centuries is the transformations from uh, of this library collection from a royal library in the palace to very much an Islamic hit, um, library that is a, the prerogative of of the Adil Shahis or expresses the prerogative of the Adil Shahis and then in the 17th century we see a shrine library that is much more accessible to mobile and local learned communities. The emergence of the Shrine Library was, according to the Chronicles, of course, instigated by the Adil Shahi court. But I would argue if we look at if we look at the larger context, then it also fits into the transformation of Arabic scholarly culture in this period. So something is happening from the 16th to the 17th centuries. And one indicator is what we can see from the manuscript evidence itself. Now, moving on to to other collections, which should put um, or place Bijapur in a larger context. I've looked at um, Arabic manuscripts from um, Arabic in, in, in the Arabic philological disciplines from three other libraries in South Asia in a larger in a, in a larger project. So Arabic manuscripts from Rampur, from the Salajang Museum in Hyderabad and from the Asafiya Library in Hyderabad. And all those manuscripts in Arabic philology that I could date um, show this um, distribution across the centuries. So what all these all these collections have in common is that in the 17th century we have we, we have a lot more manuscripts for the 17th century than we have for the 16th and 15th century. So there's a real increase happening from the 16th to the 17th centuries. So this is the quantitative argument. We have an increasing number of scribes that make use of an increased availability of paper, something scholarship on South Asia has pointed out for other areas, for Sanskrit, for Marathi, and so on. So we have more paper, and presumably, since we have more manuscripts, we probably have more, more scribes who produce and, and um, contribute these manuscripts to a circulation. But at the same time, as we have this, this, uh, this, this quantitative data, when we look at the manuscripts, we also see qualitative changes in how these manuscripts are copied, circulated, and read. And here I just want to focus on one particular example, since time is of short supply. Um, and I want to look at one paratextual phenomenon, and that's the fiqh list, or the table of contents that, I, that I've um, already showed you here with this particular manuscript. The fiqh list or the table of contents is a larger paratextual phenomenon that emerges in this from the 16th to the 17th centuries, I argue, and it emerges in Bijapur and with and among peers uh, across the ocean as far as the Ottoman lands. And so that's what I want to argue. 
that from the Eastern Mediterranean to the subcontinent, we see the emergence of the Fichrist as a new reader center device. So we can differentiate between the internal and the external Fichrist. Uh, so the internal Fichrist is something we usually have in introductions or Muqaddimas um, um, in, in general. That's sort of the authorial table of content. That's an intertextual feature which appears at the end of the introduction or preface. And here, the author uses the Fichrist sort of as a transition um, because it offers a roadmap for the reader and it shows how uh, a successive evolution of ideas of the work is, is set into uh, succinct terms and phrases. So that's part, that's the internal Fichrist, part of what the author has written. Now, the, what I want to focus on here is in contrast to the internal Fichrist is the external Fichrist. So it's the one that is created afterwards by a scribe or by someone who copied the text. Um, so it does not spring from the pen of the author, but it is added by a reader at a later stage. And this is something that I can base on a survey of Arabic philological texts um, in Cairo, in Istanbul, in Hyderabad, and in Bijapur, and to some extent also in Rampur, where we see the absence of fechrists for the 15th century in general, um, a couple of fechrists for the 16th century, and then an, incre an increased appearance over the 17th century. So I'm not arguing that these fechrists, which are added later, that they appear throughout um, throughout all the manuscripts. They appear in 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 um, a good number of manuscripts. And since I have no Arab no fechrists for the 15th century, but I have um, an increasing number of fechrists over the the following centuries, I think that there is a diachronic argument that needs to be made. Um, so apart from Bijapur, we also encounter fechrists in the Suleimani collections, like this one in Istanbul. Um, what all these fechrists have in common is they are applied on the fly leaves at the beginning of the text, usually before the title page. They can be very detailed. Um, they often, they name the, as you see with this one, they name the terms and concepts which are studied in a particular section of the book. Um, and in this case, it's a study of grammar. Um, and then the important thing also is that folio numbers are given. Um, and here's another version from the Al-Azha in Cairo, which is also from the 16th, later 16th century. Um, these folio numbers help break up the text for the reader. So it can the text can now be used, or the manuscript itself can now be used as a work of reference, um, where particular concepts, particular terms can be looked up. The reader can browse the manuscript in a very different way. Um, and so I argue that the readers, in, readers introduced this device to render texts more accessible. And this innovation is actually part of a larger transformation in learned encounters during the early modern period, as proposed by Khaled al ruwayhab who focused on deep reading practices in the Ottoman lands and suggested that we see, um, a, based on normative texts written in, early modern, in the early modern Ottoman Empire, we see um, a tendency of personalized readings um, of specific texts. So scholars and um, aspiring scholars um, are um, are not, not only allowed, it's suggested to them that they can read particular texts before they start a more socially embodied form of knowledge transmission, um, which is the common one where the, the, the student studies with the scholar. What we can see here, I think, is that with the Fichrist, we see an individual engagement of a text, um, of, of a reader with his text. So we have a specific intertextual relationship between this, the main text and the Fichrist that is recreated for each manuscript version. And since each manuscript is a unique reproduction of a work, each Fichrist could then also be produced um, or elaborated based on that, those structural particularities. So for example, the length of chapters would be different. Some scribe might focus on a, might use a different heading or a different chapter name. So not only the manuscript version would be different, but also the Fichrist could be compo composed based on very different notions. So to wrap this up, what we see here is um, that we can trace a transformation in reading strategies 
um, as, as historical practices on manuscripts. And we see that with communities in Istanbul, in Cairo, um, in Bijapur. And some of those manuscripts in, in those collections also come from other places. So we also see places like uh, Yemen, um, like Mecca and others, where the same practices are being applied. So those learned communities are very much part of a shared knowledge system in Arabic philology or a shared way of how to engage with texts. Sheldon Pollock and others recently formulated the most common denominator for world philologies, namely making sense of texts over time and space. And so I think that cap captures the significance of this fiqhist and this transformation in a very, in a very literal way. Grammar, rhetoric, and lexicography, Arabic philology, um, were disciplines and traditions of scholarly erudition in their own right, but they were instrumental in particular ways um, as auxiliary disciplines. So they were used to make sense of texts from the Quran to Hadith, poetry, fiqh, and others. And what we can see here with the corpora of, from Bijapur and other places is that scribes and scholars by the 17th century developed new techniques to make sense of texts, which then ultimately shaped the way in which they developed, in which they could make sense of other texts. And by tracing these, these new developments, these notes or these paratexts, we can see that new frameworks of learning emerge and studying. And we can see that they are very much connected uh, across the Western Union Ocean during the, the early modern period. Thank you very much for your attention.